God is always at work. He's always at work in us and through us. That was the case with Esther. She didn't always know that. Uh, neither did Mordecai. But Esther was going through an adventure which she was probably pretty confused at at times. I'd ask you to turn to the book of Esther. As you do so, I want to provide a little context for the book. So I know some of you think, oh, here we go again. He's telling the whole story of the Bible. Listen, the Bible's one story. It's not a bunch of little stories and a bunch of little good verses that give moral truths and here's all these things. It's one story. Now, it is a lot of stories in a story and it is a lot of truths. I understand that. But it's more than that. It's the story of God's love and God's provision. It's a story about God's provision for fallen man. And, and we're a part of that story even now. Esther was a part of that story. The book of Ex Esther comes after the time of Moses, remember he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. Uh, Satan had his hand in that, trying to keep them there, trying to destroy the Jews. Moses brought them out, brought them to the land of promise. Joshua took them into the promised land. They conquered the land. It was then that the time of the judges came on, and the judges were raised up by God to deliver Israel because they kept sinning against God. After the time of the judges was Saul, David, and Solomon. They were the kings over the United Kingdom, one nation with a king. Because of Solomon's sin, the kingdom was divided. I know we're going through some of this during our Sunday school times. The kingdom was divided. Then Israel was judged because they were so evil. The people in Israel were scattered all over around the nations surrounding. Some of those nations were brought in. And that's where we come up with the Samaritan, who was a Jew with mixed nationalities in with their, with their ethnicity because of the, the conquering of Assyria um, to, to Israel. It was more than 100 years after that that God finally said to Judah, whose capital was Israel, I'm going to judge you too. And so God judged Judah, carried them away in captivity. It was Nebuchadnezzar and it was Babylon that took all the Jews into captivity. Not all of them. Nebuchadnezzar left the real poor people, left some of the farmers, left some of the people who were, weren't productive, and he took all the smartest, all the richest, all the most intelligent, all the most gifted people back to Babylon with him. That was the captivity. That was the exile. One of those people in the exile, his name was Daniel. One day, Daniel, as he was reading the Bible, he was reading the book of Jeremiah, Daniel chapter 9. In the book of, da of Jeremiah, Daniel read that there was going to be 70 years to the captivity. Daniel's now an old man, and he's thinking, man, we got to be near the end. And so he's praying, God, show me the time of the end. And so God reveals to Daniel the times and the seasons, and that there was a judgment for uh, God's people, Israel, and for the holy city of Jerusalem. And so we have Daniel. Then after Daniel was the time where it had been prophesied by Isaiah that, that Cyrus would let the people go back to Israel. There was a, a return to, to Israel. And so we have a, a leadership in about 530 or so by Zerubbabel of the Jewish people from the area of Babylon back to Israel. They made their way back, but not all of them. A lot of them stayed. A lot of them were fully settled. They had businesses. They were wealthy. They were established. They had leadership positions. And it's during that time that the book of Esther happened. So remember, the, the exile is over. Some of the Jews had returned. Eighty years later, the book of Esther, 
After Esther comes Ezra and Nehemiah. So right in the middle, they're still part of the return. It hasn't happened. The, the temple hasn't been rebuilt. The walls haven't been rebuilt. Esther's here. And it was in there that we have the book of Esther re- written during the time of the return of the exiles. So we have, uh, by the way, during that exile, we have people that in our lifetime still lived in the area of Babylon because of the captivity. If you study it out in the 1950s, there were were 120,000 Jews in Baghdad. Baghdad is 60 miles south of of, uh, Babylon. And so there still were Jews living there during some of our lifetimes, not mine, but some others who are here today. And it was during that time that persecution increased. There was another attempted annihilation of all the Jews. It's happened through the ages. Hitler was the last great, great one that we know of. But there was this one other time, uh, several others, but one of the other times when the devil tried to destroy the Jews was the book of Esther. It's where Esther became the one who was instrumentally used by God to save the nation of Israel. There's a feast that is remembered because of the book of Esther. Does anybody know what book or, or feast that is? I heard it. Purim, right, Purim. And it's called Purim because Haman cast lots, which was Pur, P-U-R, to decide when he was going to destroy all of the Jews. And so they celebrate it even yet to this day. Well, in Esther chapter 1, if we're going to start there, and this is not a formal outline, I'm telling you the story. That there's this guy named Xerxes, it calls him Ahasuerus here in Esther chapter 1. He's over the whole empire. Consider the size of the empire. The empire encompassed all of the land of Turkey, Lebanon, Syria, uh, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Israel, Egypt, and Sudan. Can you imagine? 127 different countries in all of that. And it was the emperor that was over all of that. The emperor at this time, Xerxes. Now he's Persian. It's the Persian empire. It's no longer Babylonian. So remember, the Babylonians were the first great empire. Then we had the Medo-Persian empire, which Daniel was a part of the beginning of that. Now Esther's in that time. And then after the Medo-Persian empire was the Greeks. And that's why our New Testament is in Greek, because the Greek empire forced everybody to speak and write Greek and to, to take on Hellenistic culture. And even during the time of Christ, that still prevailed. But it was during the time of Jesus that the Roman Empire was, uh, it was over all of that area and even more. And so we see the different empires. We studied them in the book of Daniel. He foretold all of that. Well, it was during the Medo-Persian Empire that Xerxes decided, hey, I'm going to attack Greece one more time and we're going to take them over. In fact, one of the reasons why Alexander the, the Great was so angry when he came and conquered all of that land was because of how the Persians treated the Greeks, and they treated them very harshly. So it says in the Bible that the Greek one would come with great speed and and swoop over and overtake them in a very short amount of time. There was great anger from the Greek community against the Persians. We have here that this guy in Medo-Persia wanted to defeat the Greeks. He's getting everybody hyped up. Now, by the way, we're a year away from elections. You happy about that or sad? (laughs) <laughs> oh man, Lord help us. He's in the middle of trying to get all of his people revved up. He's going to do this Greek campaign. He's going to defeat the Greeks. And so he's going at it. And one of the ways that the kings or the emperors had to do it was they had to make sure that all the people were on board with this. Not that the emperor couldn't do whatever he wanted. He could But he knew that if he was going to be really successful, if he could get everybody on board, that that would give us him the best chance. And so he does a party for 180 days. Does 180 180 days mean anything to you students who are here today? Any of you who work in school? It was a 180-day party. That's what it is for some of you kids, right? 180 days. Well, it was a party. It went on for 180 days, and at the end of it, there were seven more days to the party. And in there, he's trying to get everybody psyched up. He's getting ready for this Greek campaign. And, and he says about this last part of the feast, he must have had the most important people there that he needed to impress. 
He's got wine. He's got food. And here was his rule that nobody had to drink, but anybody could drink as much as they wanted. Just go for it. He had golden vessels and they're all drinking out of it. They're having a great time. Well, at the end of seven days, the last day, Xerxes had had one too many. And I'm, I have a feeling he had had one too many all seven days. And here he was at the end of the party and he had this great idea. I know how I can get everybody really worked up. I'm going to have my wife come in here and dance for them. So some of you husbands, how well would that go over? Any good, you think? Hey, honey, come on in and dance for everybody. We're having an open house today. It's like, hey, Lisa. I said in the the first service, I married a hobbecker, and that ain't happening. In fact, I might regret the very moment that I said it if I ever did. Well, it's likely some of the wives of the husbands that were with Xerxes were with uh, Vashti, who was the queen. By the way, what a woman. What a woman to stand up to the emperor. And uh, this morning we were talking about that a little bit, you know, how there's so much to admire with Vashti. Listen, Vashti was the mother of Artaxerxes, who was there during the time of some of the rest of the exiles. She was likely instrumental also in saving the Jews. She was quite a woman. And by the way, he was uh, the, the stepson of Esther, made sure that the rest of the nation of Israel was stored. That's how I see it. I mean, there were very in, influential people placed in this kingdom. Well, Vashti said, I'm not doing it. I'm just not doing it. Well, remember what Xerxes was doing. He was trying to get everybody on board with this idea he had and get everybody excited. And right at the end of it, uh, he's trying to get everybody to say, yes, 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 yes. And then his wife says, no, <laughs> I'm not coming. So he turned to all of his advisors and was like, what are you going to do about a woman like that? You know, we better put her in her place. And so he turned to all of his advisors, and uh, one of them was called Mamukin. Uh, if any of our elders was named that, I might not take your advice. I'm sorry. It just uh, doesn't, doesn't ring true for me. It wouldn't make it to the list of names that uh, I'd want to name my kid. But anyway, they all uh, were giving him him advice. They said, all right, here, let's make a law. Have you ever heard the phrase, the the law of the Medes and the Persians? It's like when I say it, that's the way it's going to be. And that's how it it stays. The laws of the Medes and the Persians, it's not going to change. They advised him, make a law that Vashti can never come in your presence again. By the way, uh, they saved her life. And that speaks volumes for who she was. Um, She was a very influential woman and highly respected. Uh, they didn't kill her. They didn't do any of that to her, but she was never allowed to come into his presence again. And besides that, they said, let's make a law uh, that no woman can disobey their husbands because now this, this woman, you know, disobeyed the emperor. Now our wives are going to think they don't have to do everything we tell them. Now, uh, someday I'll, uh, we can meet and I can counsel you and I talk through what it means to be submissive and loving and have leadership in the home and complementarian in all your relationships. We can do that another time. But I just want to say whatever was happening here, was not likely the biblical precedent. It's not likely they were reading scripture and saying, well, here's how God wants it to be. More likely, Xerxes is trying to save face. He's trying to say, well, she said no, and I'm putting my foot down. Only he didn't put it down as hard as maybe he thought he did. Because by the time we get to chapter 2, he's really regretting his decision. And so he said to his advisors, you know, what should I do? And his advisors said, well, Uh, Let's look for a young, uh, beautiful woman to be the queen. Now, I don't know what kids shows you've watched or what kids books you've, you've read or what stories you've read, but Esther trying to be the queen was probably not a beauty contest in the, in the same sense that we think it is. It wasn't a, it wasn't a talent show. It wasn't anything nice. These girls were taken by force, put into a harem, likely never ever being able to get out of that harem the rest of their lives. And so they were in bondage to that. And then they were forced to to perform and look certain ways. It was not a nice thing. Even though he needed a queen, he was going to make this, this woman an honored person. What happened to get to that point was not likely very good. And it was not nice. But he he's collecting these girls, these young, beautiful girls. And as he does so, he takes in this young girl. Her name is Hadassah or Esther. 
In verse 5 of chapter 2, we see introduced to the story a guy named Mordecai. Now, in the first service, I kept saying the wrong name, and I got to apologize to you. Whenever I call to the kids, I call them by the wrong names, and I do that here too. It's too many names for me to keep straight. So if I say the wrong name, feel free to shout it out and correct me uh, if you would, please. But Mordecai, if you, are, if you are part of the celebration of Purim, what they do is they read through the whole book of Esther. And they have kids with noisemakers and, and different things to, to, whenever the name Haman is read, they yell, boo. And every time they hear the name Mordecai, they're like, yay, they cheer him. Well, that, that would be a part of the normal reading during the Feast of Purim. Well, Mordecai was a good guy. He was a descendant of the Benjamites, out of the tribe of Benjamin. And here he is in, in uh, Susa. His, his great-grandfather had been taken into captivity under Jehoiachin, um, and, and there he is still in Babylon. He's settled. He's a part of the royal court in some fashion, and we believe that because we see Mordecai um, in, in this close vicinity of things that are happening in the palace and, and with intimate knowledge of what's going on. And so Mordecai is likely very involved. It says in verse 5 that he was a Jew in Susa, the citadel. His name was Mordecai. He had a cousin named Esther. Esther's parents had passed. I don't know what happened. It was, it was a tragic thing to lose parents at such a young age. But the cousin becomes the father for Esther. And as they live together, he realizes that she's taken. And when she's being taken, in the middle of being taken, he says to her, don't tell anybody you're a Jew. He had to have been concerned for some reason. It's likely there were a contingent of people that were anti-Semites. They were opposed to the Jews. By the way, that has been the history of the Jews since the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They've been a very hated people. They're not the only ones that have undergone persecution or prejudice. A lot of people have. It's unfortunate that's a part of the human race. But they have gone through this prejudice. They have gone through times when people severely hated them. And there was a contingent of people in Babylon that hated the Jews. Likely they hated the Jews because when they went to Babylon, the smartest, most gifted people, most eloquent people were very prosperous. And so I'm sure there was a degree of jealousy, uh, suspicion, those kinds of things. Mordecai said to her, don't tell anybody that you're a Jew. She's taken into the harem. She's given spices. She's given clothing. She's taught etiquette. She's taught how to act around the king. She's taught all these things. And in a year from them, she went before the king or the emperor. And he was so impressed with her that he made her the queen. And then in, in verse 18 of chapter 2, he has a special feast for Esther called the Feast of Esther. And they celebrated this new queen. In the middle of this, Mordecai, as I said before, had access to the courts. He was in the vicinity of the courts. And so we have another little small story here that makes a lot of sense as we go on through the story. But in this story, we see that Mordecai hears a plot. Some of the, the eunuchs, the servants of the king, are so angry with the king, they want to kill him. Mordecai overhears it. He tells Esther. Esther tells Xerxes, and Xerxes has him killed. The Bible says that, he was put, that they were put on the gallows. Now, for those of you who love Western movies, which I love Western movies, don't think John Wayne here. Think large, pointy pole. They were impaled on a pole in view of the public, so the public would fear and not do some of the same things. And so these two men were impaled on a pole. And then it was written down in the book of the Chronicles of uh, Susa or of Medo-Persia that this guy did this thing, and then it was forgotten. As we get to chapter 3, we see the story progresses because now we see a guy named Haman. So say it with me. Haman. I said, did that for you. So you remember, remind me, if I call him Mordecai, he's Haman. Haman is a bad guy. Haman isn't just an ordinary guy. I want to take you back into the stories of, you know, Samuel and the kings and the chronicles. There was a point in time where Saul was king. And God told Saul, go and destroy all of the Amalekites. And then Samuel came to check on Saul to see what was happening. 
And Saul's like, yo, good to see you. I've been obedient to God. I've done everything God wanted. And Samuel said, what then is the bleeding of the sheep that I hear? And Saul was like, well, I feared the people and I'm, you know, I decided to keep some of them. And he also kept the king alive. Do you remember his name? Agag. Haman was an Agagite. This was hundreds of years later. And still the Agagites or the Amalekites still hated the Jews. When Samuel found out that Saul did not kill Agag, he told his son, go and kill him. And his son wouldn't. <clears throat> Samuel went and hacked him in pieces. <clears throat> and still to that day, there existed a great hatred between uh, the Amalekites and the Jews. The Amalekites did not like them. There's still a grudge. And I, I believe it mentions it that way because there's a tension here. That Haman, Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, uh, was set up by uh, Xerxes to be the second in the kingdom. Mordecai took note of that. I'm sure Mordecai was very aware of what was going on. And it was the case that every time uh, Haman drove by Mordecai, everybody would would uh, bow down to him, but not, not Mordecai. And I don't believe this is just biblical reasons. There probably were some, or there might have been some, but I think it's because he knew how Haman felt about the Jews. So here he is, day after day, driving past uh, Mordecai and getting more angry and more angry because he won't bow down. So Haman sends his guys out and says, what's the deal with this guy? Why won't he bow down to me? Everybody else does. And so they asked Mordecai, and Mordecai told them, because I'm a Jew. And from that point on, Haman made it his goal to destroy the Jews. I want you to keep in mind that he had the ability to destroy every single Jew that was alive. Because they were a part of the empire. Maybe a few had gotten outside of the empire, but not likely. They were likely all a part of that. All of that land that I mentioned before. So uh, Haman starts plotting. What he does is he casts these dice. This is how decisions were made. Throws the dice and decides what day, what month, what year should we do everything. And he finally came up with the 13th day of the 12th month. What we need to do is destroy all of the, all of the Jews. And so Haman goes to Xerxes and says, here's what needs to happen. We got these people that have their own laws. They disregard our laws. You need to destroy them. And so Xerxes He's now already lost the Greek campaign. He already lost it. And, and so he's probably thinking, I got to make sure I keep things in order. So Haman goes to him and says, here's what's going on. We got to destroy these people. So Xerxes says, okay, they made a plan. And they wrote it out and they sent it out with couriers. Now it was a lot like what you would picture the Pony Express being. The, the um, memo would go to the riders and the riders would go out to other riders. And then those riders would go out to other riders until it went all the way through all of the empire. There were probably locations where if you wanted to know what the king's decrees were, you could go to those locations and read them or hear them. And so this message went all out, like it did with the decree about the women obeying their husbands and submitting to them. That went out by couriers. So this was all out. It was in motion. The plan had started. The annihilation of the Jews was going to happen. They were going to be completely destroyed. So the letters went out. When Mordecai heard it and the Jews, they were very distraught. They were upset. Now, I don't see anybody doing this. I suppose that when we're sad or we're mourning or we're grieving, maybe we you know, stay in our pajamas or I don't know what it is. Maybe, maybe you wear black. But sackcloth and ashes, I'm, I'm having a little di difficulty grasping uh, the full picture of what that looked like. But Mordecai was very publicly placed where he was crying out, where he was grieving, where he was mourning and sackcloth and ashes, likely had ashes on top of his head and just ratty clothes on. Esther's maidens heard about it. So they went and told Esther, man, your cousin is really carrying on. So Esther said, here, take him some clothes quick. Nobody can see him. So they went out and he's like, no, not going to do it. So then Esther sends one of her, her male servants out to ask Mordecai, what in the world is going on? And Mordecai told them, Esther's got to go to the queen, king. 
Esther's got to go to him and tell him, don't destroy all of the Jews. We're all going to be destroyed. Now, one of the reasons we believe Mordecai had great access to the court and the court systems is because he had an actual writing of the decree. He gave it to Esther's servant who took it to Esther and told Esther, Mordecai told you, you got to go in front of the king uh, and you got to stop all of this. Otherwise, all of the Jews are going to be killed. This was a desperate plot. This was really um, concerning for any person who was a Jew or who was a friend of the Jew. This thing was going to go forward. Well, Esther was hesitant. She's, she's like, I can't, I just can't go in front of the emperor. I can't just walk in there. People get killed for doing that. If you walk in on the emperor, uh, you're going to take your life in your own hand. Unless sometimes he raises his scepter, then your life will be saved. Well, then Mordecai talks to her. I'm going to read a few verses in Esther chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 13. Esther chapter 4 and verse 13. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. So she's saying, listen, Esther, you might be the queen, but you're not going to escape. Verse 14, for if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. So at least here we have indication he believed that God was providentially preserving the Jews. He says it's going to come from somewhere, but you need to know something. You and your father's house are going to perish. And here's some precious words. Who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You know, I don't know what you're going through, but who knows? Maybe God has you in this place at this time because he knows. Listen, he does. He's got you in this place and this time, and you were born where you were born. You you are who you are because he's got plans for you. You might never be the president of the United States, and who would want that anyway? You might never save a whole country, but God is doing what he wants to do through you by his design and by his choice. And who knows? Maybe the thing that you're going through right now is a thing that God has put you in so that he could do a great work for someone else. We know that God is always doing a great work in us and through us, and here that was happening for Esther. And so she said, all right, hold a fast three days. All of you fast, and at the end of the three days, I'm going to go in. So the three days were up. She went in before Xerxes. I'm sure she was very fearful. She hadn't been in there for 30 days. Maybe she's thinking, he hates me. He hasn't called me in. What's going on? Uh, I haven't been in there. She goes in the room. I can picture her coming in the back corner. The emperor sees her, and he raises his scepter. She goes up and touches the tip of his scepter, and he says, what do you want, Esther? What do you want? And she said, can you come to a meal? I want to have a meal tomorrow. How about you and Haman? Come for a meal. Just you and Haman. I'll do a special meal for you. He said, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. Come on, I will do that. So he gets Haman, and they go to this banquet that Esther prepares. They get to the banquet, and uh, the king says to her, all right, what do you want now? So she's got the wine and the food, and and uh, she says, well, I can't tell you today, but uh, if you would come for the meal, another banquet tomorrow, then I will tell you. I don't know if she was afraid. I don't know why the hesitancy or if it was part of the plan to butter him up. I don't know. But I do know that that one day was providence. It was the providence of God. It was after that banquet that Mordecai or after, uh, that Haman left, went home really joyful Xerxes went to bed uh, some point in time in the night, but Haman went home and he's going to be, he was like, you, you're not going to believe this. I just had dinner with the, with the emperor and with the queen. It was just the three of us. And you can't believe how, how things are going for me. Life is great. And so he rehearses to his friends about all of his sons and his riches and how great everything is and how life is going so wonderful. But there was this one thing. Just ruined his day. I mean, this is like the best day of his life. On his way home, who do you suppose he passed? It was Mordecai. And Mordecai refused to bow down to him. And Haman is just like furious. He's already got the plan in motion to kill them all. And so he's not bold enough just to take him. He's got to have some kind of a plan. And so his wife says, how about this? 
How about you build a gallows eight stories high? Remember, this was a pointy stick. This wasn't hang him high from an oak tree kind of a thing. They were going to impale him. Why don't you have the workers put it up tonight, and tomorrow we'll, we'll, we'll have him hung on the pole. And so Haman's like, yeah, it's great. That is a great plan. He goes to bed, and he sleeps really well, and goes to the palace the next morning. Meanwhile, Xerxes is trying to sleep. You ever had a night like that where you couldn't quite fall asleep? Corey said he was up till four in the morning. Played, what'd you do? Go bowling and drank coffee. <laughs> Stayed awake till four. Uh, last night I woke up at 12.17. I'm like, oh, it's time to get up. I got to go over my stuff for, for today. And it was only 12.17. <laughs> so I went back to bed. But sometimes when I wake up, do you ever get the gears? They start turning. And you're like, oh, no, now I'm not going to fall asleep. Did the kids make it home? You know, what do we got to do with the house? What's happening at church? What do we got to work on? I got stuff to do. I got places to go. I got people to see. And all of a sudden I'm thinking about all of it and I can't sleep. That was Xerxes. And so he wakes these guys up and he makes them come in and read to him. (laughs) At least I have a Kindle. But here he had these guys, they had to read to him. And they're reading to him about all the things that had happened that were good and the chronicles of the the kings of the Medo-Persian Empire. And they're reading about this guy, Mordecai, who saved his life. And he's like, wow, did we ever do anything for him? And they're like, no, we didn't do anything. So he, 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 he says to, to them, man, is there anybody in the court? What are we going to do? And so I'm going to leave the story there. I was going to leave it with the fact that he went to bed and fell asleep. Listen, there's a turning point where God begins to show us he is doing something. Mordecai didn't know about it. Esther didn't know about it. But God was at work behind the scenes. One important thing you got to know about the book of Esther it doesn't mention the name of God anywhere, not once. And uh, it's kind of like our lives. Sometimes we don't see God overtly working, but he's still there. He still cares. He's still doing a thing. He's still at work. And it's not just that God is behind the scenes. God is the scene. And, and even though he's not right here, I can't tell you what color shoes or what color shirt he's wearing. I know God is here and I feel his presence I know he's done a work in my life, and I know he's preserved me. I know that God has blessed me all my days. I know that I'm here today and that I'm blessed. I know that God has been good. He's been faithful. Damaris Carbaugh was at camp meeting this summer, and her song that I enjoy so much is, He's been faithful, so faithful to me. Our God has been good to us. But sometimes in the middle of it all, it doesn't feel that way. Sometimes in the middle of it all, we wonder. Sometimes in the middle of it all, we lose our thankfulness. To be thankful to God for what we're going through. I have a challenge for you, and it's not write down all the things to be thankful for. I have a challenge for you this week. Write down all the difficulties you're going through and thank God for them. Because I promise you, God is there. And God's in the works. And God's doing a work. You know, the one song says when the world feels like it's falling apart, it's just falling into place. Um, And God is there. He's doing a work. I don't know what you're all going through. I know some of you are going through some struggles. And I want to tell you that you need to have a thankful heart. One quote that uh, Dr. Bob Jones Sr. used to say, that when gratitude dies on the altar of a man's heart, that man is well nigh hopeless to have gratitude, even when we're in the most difficult of situations. Because I promise you, God is at work. He's always doing a work in you. He's always doing a work through you. Our God has never failed us. We weren't delivered from every hardship, but we were delivered through every hardship. And there's stuff yet ahead. If God told us about it, we wouldn't want to go through it. But it's still ahead. I want to tell you, at the, at the head, at end of the tunnel, there is a light. God is waiting for us there. He's there. When we arrive, he'll be there. When we go through it, he's going through it with us. And it should cause us to be a thankful people. If you're here today and and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to urge you, won't you become a thankful person and accept his gift of salvation? Repent of your sin and ask Jesus into your heart to save you. And then rejoice with us that even when we're in a difficult time, that we can be a thankful people.